Hello, my amazing children. This is Grandma Carla with more of Emily's Runaway Imagination, and we are on Chapter 6, The Scary Night. A library made a difference. Emily read her book of English fairy tales every minute she could find. She even sneaked the flashlight upstairs and read under the covers until Mama caught her at it. Fortunately, there was a full moon, and after Mama went downstairs again to read her own book, Emily was able to lean out the window and read by moonlight until she finished her chapter. The dove that turned into a handsome young man, the girl who had to bring water from the well in a sieve, the old woman whose pig would not go over the stile, Emily loved every word. Best of all, she enjoyed scary stories. The tales of giants and ogres and the one about a fairy, fair young woman with a golden arm who had turned into a ghost. That was a spooky story. There had never been any scary, spooky stories in any of Emily's readers. The book Mama was reading was a book of poetry. And that made a difference, too, because now Mama went about her work reciting instead of singing. Mama would recite, I remember, I remember, the house where I was born, the little window where the sun came peeping in at morn. Emily could just picture Mama as a little girl, waking up in the morning in the east, in the house back east. But Emily's favorite poem was a different one. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Mama would say in a spooky voice as she fried the potatoes. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. The way Mama said it gave Emily a shivery feeling between her shoulder blades. It was the scariest thing that Emily had ever heard, and she enjoyed every word of it, although she did not entirely understand it. The poem was about a raven that kept saying, or rather, quoting, Nevermore, quoth the raven, nevermore, was the way many of the stanzas ended. Say the spooky poem again, Mama, she would ask, and then shiver deliciously as Mama recited. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Emily enjoyed spooky things when she knew that she really had nothing to be scared about. Perhaps that is why Emily decided a spooky evening would be fun with her, would, would be fun when she had her cousin June come spend the night with her. Or perhaps it was the still expectant feeling of that hot, hot day that made her feel that something was about to happen. She decided that when bedtime came, she and June would go up the stairs to bed and tell spooky stories with witches and ghosts and have a good time scaring each other. That is, they could if June would cooperate, but knowing June, Emily could not be sure of this. In school, when Mrs. Plot, when Miss Plotthoth led the singing, she instructed the class to enunciate so that each word was distinct. Ring out, ye bells. Emily and the rest of the class opened their mouths and moved their lips so that each word was separate from every other. Ring out, ye bells. Not June. She sang loudly, loud and gleefully. Ring out, ye blue bells. That was June for you. Ring out, ye bells. That evening, after supper, June, carrying her rolled-up nightgown and her toothbrush, was brought to Emily's house by Uncle Avery and Aunt Bess, who were on their way to a whist party. Hello, Emily, she said when Emily opened the door, and Emily could tell from the way that she said it that June was excited to be spending the night away from home. That was a good sign. Then Emily discovered that this was the night that Daddy had to go uptown for band practice. That made it even better. There was something scary about being alone in the great big house with Mama. Something scary but cozy too. Sometimes Emily enjoyed having Mama all to herself. Although, of course, tonight June would be there too. Daddy practiced his solo. 
Sailor beware, on his baritone horn a couple of times before he went uptown to join the rest of the boys, as the men in the pitchfork band were called. Everyone hoped that the band, which played at the state fair and the livestock expedition, would help put Pitchfork on the map, although Emily knew that Pitchfork was already on the map. She had looked at the atlas at school, and there it was, a tiny dot on the map of Oregon. When Daddy had gone, Mama began to read her library book, while Emily and June studied the Montgomery Ward catalog to see what they would buy if they had any money. Emily looked, as she always did, at the picture of the rotary egg beater, which could whip cream in no time at all. After that, she and June had difficulty looking at the catalog together because Emily wanted to look at the beautiful toys some people must have enough money to buy, and June wanted to look at all of the different auto robes, many of them like real Indian blankets. Finally, Emily let June take the catalog because she was company. She looked herself at the book of wallpaper samples and pretended that she could buy new wallpaper for the whole house. She would start with the downstairs bedroom, where a pattern of yellow roses would be pretty. Yellow was Mama's favorite color. She always said yellow was so happy. Out on the back porch, plants whined and scratched at the screen door. Mama walked from the sitting room into the dining room and called, What's the matter, Plints? Plints whimpered and tried to open the screen door with his paw. Spooks, thought Emily. Plints must be scared of spooks. Now, Plints, you run along and sleep in the woodshed the way you always do, Mama said as she closed the door. Dogs were not allowed in the house any more than pigs or cows. They belonged outdoors. Plint sounded scared of something, didn't he? Emily remarked when Mama sat down again. Now, Emily, said Mama, don't let your imagination run away with you. She said it with a smile, because Mama understood what many people did not. It was fun to let one's imagination run away. It made life so exciting to let one's imagination go galloping off just the way a real horse had once made Mama's life pretty exciting for a while. Emily decided it was time to produce the treat that she had been saving, bananas. Grandpa had a whole bunch hanging in the window of his store, and when he heard that June was going to spend the night with Emily, he had given Emily two bananas for a treat. When Emily went out to the kitchen to get them, Plints whined and scratched at the screen door once more. The two girls peeled their bananas and began to eat. Emily ate with little bites, chewing as slowly as she could to make the precious fruit last as long as she could. June bit off big pieces of the banana. It takes so much it tastes so much better in big bites, she explained. But it doesn't last as long, protested Emily. But it tastes better while it does last, said June. Now, Emily, said Mama, you can't expect everyone to enjoy eating bananas the same way. Of course, she could not. But Emily wished she and June could do something the same way, just once. If Muriel were here, she would understand immediately how a banana should be made to last as long as possible, even though in Portland she probably had bananas every day if she wanted them. Plints persisted in scratching at the screen door. Plint, stop that, ordered Mama. The dog stopped scratching and began to whimper. Plints is a fraidy cat, said June. You mean fraidy dog, said Emily, and both girls giggled. When the bananas were eaten, Emily turned to her mother. Say the poem again, the spooky one. Mama closed her book. Just one verse, she said, and she began. Once upon a midnight dreary, while outside a lilac bush began to scratch at the window as if it too wanted to come inside, and the curtain stirred in a ghostly way. When Mama finished the verse, she said briskly, Now off to bed you go. Just one more verse, begged Emily. Scoot, said Mama. The girls washed their faces and brushed their teeth at the kitchen sink, and tonight, because she had a guest, Emily picked up the flashlight to guide the way upstairs. Usually, she went alone through the long, dark hall and up the long, dark flight of stairs to the dark bedroom and thought nothing of it. 
The house was dark because each room had just one electric light hanging by a cord from the middle of the ceiling. The ceilings were high, and all of the Bartlett's except Mama, who after all was not born a Bartlett, were tall people, so the lights were too high for Emily to reach without standing on a chair. Mama could barely reach them by standing on tiptoe. The tall Bartlett's had not wanted lights hanging where they could bump into them in the dark. In the farthest bedroom, the girls bounced into the bed and pulled the quilts up under their chins because now a cool breeze was blowing through the house. Emily played the flashlight around the big room. Its weak light made the white iron bedstead, the only furniture in the room, look ghostly. Even the windows, which, with which inside shutters instead of curtains, looked like oblong eyes in the scary night. Isn't it scary, whispered Emily. And did you notice there was something funny about the way Plintz wanted to come in the house? Probably he just wanted a banana, scoffed June. Dogs don't eat bananas, said Emily, thinking that Muriel would have been so much more satisfactory a cousin to be spending the night. Muriel would have enjoyed huddling in the middle of the bed making up ghost stories. June's imagination would never run away with her. She had an imagination like, like a plow horse. The old house made a snapping noise. I'll bet that is a ghost walking across the roof, wringing its hands, whispered Emily, trying to work up a good shiver in spite of June. It's the temperature changing, said June. You know your house always makes noises when it begins to cool off. This was the sort of thing that Emily might have expected from matter-of-fact June, who was not entering into the spooky spirit of things. Emily tried again, still whispering because she heard Mama coming upstairs. Did you know this house has 13 rooms? Well, said June, our great-grandfather has a big family. He needed lots of rooms. Oh, honestly, June, thought Emily crossly. You aren't being any fun at all. June was right, of course, but it would be fun to think for a little while that there was a ghost walking across the roof of a 13-room house, especially when Daddy was still uptown at band practice. It would be pleasantly scary if the pioneer ancestors had left a ghost or two around the house, perhaps in the cupola, but these ancestors must have been too busy clearing the land and settling the state of Oregon to participate in any ghostly activities like people in some of the sad old songs Mama sometimes sang. As far as Emily knew, there was not a broken-hearted damsel or a disappointed lover killed in a duel in the lot. They did get pretty hungry towards the end of the journey across the plains of Oregon, but nobody languished or wasted away. Apparently, they ate a good square, square meal when they got to Oregon and went right to work cutting trees, pulling stumps, and planting crops. June was right. The house, even if it did have 13 rooms, was not the least bit haunted. Emily tried to think of something ghostly, but all she could think of was the skeleton of a cow down in the pasture, and there was nothing ghostly about that. The cow did not die of a broken heart. It was a cow Daddy had to shoot because it ate some of the baled wire. It had been one of Daddy's best milkers, and it was a shame that a cow that gave milk so rich and butter flat fat had to go to eating baling wire. And then Plintz howled. It was a long, drawn-out, dismal, unearthly howl that began low in the scale and rose to a high, eerie note. Each girl caught her breath. June, whispered Emily, do you know what that means? When a dog howls, it means somebody is going to die. This time, June did not sound so matter-of-fact. He's probably howling at the moon. There isn't any moon, said Emily, realizing for the first time that sometime during the evening the sky had clouded over. It is a dark and cloudy night. The girls huddled closer together in bed. Somewhere, a loose shutter banged as persistently as if someone was trying to get in. Emily remembered a snatch of Mama's spooky poem about someone rapping, rapping at my chamber door. 
Her heart pounded like the dasher of a churn. Plince's howl rose and fell away again in a way that made the girls shiver. The snap of the floor in the bedroom made them both start. They giggled nervously and lay still and tense. Plince's howl died and the night seemed unnaturally silent as if it were waiting for something. His howl couldn't mean someone is going to die, said Bru June bravely. Nobody in Pitchfork is even sick. And then it came, a flash of lightning that for one instant made the bedroom seem as bright as midday and the white iron bedstead look like the bed of a ghost. The girls had held their breath until the crash and the roll of the thunder seemed to shake the world. Uh, I guess Plintz was howling because he knew there was going to be a storm, said Emily, relieved to have an explanation for the dog's peculiar behavior. Y yes, agreed June. I was almost scared there for a minute. One more, once more, lightning brought a flash of midday into the bedroom, and the girls waited for thunder to shatter the night. One, two, three, four, five, shouted June. Fifteen, sixteen, and the thunder cracked. The lightning struck sixteen miles away. If you count between the flash and the time you hear the thunder, you can tell. This was reassuring. Emily huddled against June, counting. Fifteen miles. Thirteen miles. The storm was moving slowly. Then the rain began. The first big drops hit the roof like the rattle of puddles pebbles and then as the thunder rolled on the rain began to fall steadily with a drumming sound on the flat tin roof the familiar sound of the rain on the roof was comforting to emily she lay in the bed thinking drowsily that she really liked june in spite of her plow horse imagination she was a sturdy girl and the best rope jumper and jacks player at the school emily may have fallen asleep Afterwards, she was not sure, because it seemed to her that she continued to hear thunder. Sometime later, she became aware of a new sound in the night, a clanging, banging sound that seemed very close, almost directly below on the back porch. This time, her imagination was not running away with her. It couldn't be running away with her because she could not imagine what that noise was. Emily sat up in bed. June, what's that noise? She asked aloud to make herself heard above the wind and the rain. June raised herself in bed and listened. Wham! Bang! Crash! This was too strange. A dog's howl, thunder, rain, these were easily explained. But this? Emily jumped out of bed and looked out of the window. Through the lashing branches of the horse chestnut tree, she could see a ghostly white figure moving across the barnyard. She shut her eyes and opened them again. The ghostly figure really was there. She could see it with her own eyes. June, Emily cried, look. June leaned on the sill beside her. This time, she had no matter-of-fact explanation. Oh, she clutched Emily's arms. It's a ghost and it's coming closer. I'm going to go get Mama. Emily snatched up the flashlight and ran across the cold floor to her mother's bedroom. Wait for me, begged June. For once, the cousins felt the same way about something. Mama, called Emily, beaming the flashlight on the bed. It was empty. There was no answer. Only the rain drumming on the roof. Wham, bang, crash. Something seemed to be pounding on the back door. Somewhere in the night, Goliath the bull bellowed, and Emily wondered if the ghost was chasing him. Mama's gone. Maybe the ghost got her, said June with a shiver. Your imagination is running away with you, Emily told her cousin. But where could Mama be? Had the, the thing in the barnyard run off with her? Emily tried to say woe to her imagination, but she could not. If only this had not been Daddy's band practice night. Maybe she's in the kitchen, June sounded shaky. Let's go downstairs. Clutching each other's hand, the girls made their way downstairs. The thin beam of their flashlight seemed feeble in the darkness of the hall. A strong draft whipped at their nightgowns, telling him that the back door 
which Mama had closed earlier in the evening, was now open. Mama, called Emily, and knew she was calling to an empty house. The draft was even stronger in the dining room, and the girls huddled, shivering. The back door must have blown open, said June. Maybe we should shut it. That thing might. Yes, agreed Emily quickly. You shut it. It's your house, said June. Neither girl wanted to shut the back door. Let's both do it, said Emily, and fearfully they approached the door. When Emily turned the flashlight on it, she revealed an enormous ragged hole torn in the screen. Look, she cried, and in a panic, slammed the door and leaned against it. It must have been made by the ghost. Yes, said June, but a ghost wouldn't have to tear a hole in the screen, quavered Emily. It would just float through. I hope it was leaving instead of coming in, said June. Please, let's turn on a light someplace. Wham, bang, crash. I'm too scared, said Emily, but she did swing the beam of the flashlight around the dining room and the kitchen. Look, cried June. Emily looked, and there, cowering under the kitchen table, was Plintz. She could have cried with relief. It must have been Plintz who tore the screen door. He was so scared he ran right through it. Yes, but what was he scared of? June wanted to know. The dog flattened himself on the floor and crawled, whimpering, towards Emily, who stooped to pat him. Plintz licked her hand gratefully, and Emily felt almost as grateful to be touching a real, live, honest-to-goodness dog. But Mama, where was Mama? Could she have gone outdoors? On a night like this? Bravely, ghost or no ghost, Emily returned to the back door, and as she opened it, Goliath bellowed again somewhere out there in the night. It was terrible when something as big and as mean-looking as Goliath was scared. Emily turned her flashlight into the night. The wind and the rain seemed to snatch the feeble being and twist it into a nightmare shape against the lashing horse tree, chestnut tree. But Emily caught a glimpse of a ghostly figure, a figure with a pitchfork in its hand. June, she cried, dropping the flashlight. It is a ghost, a ghost with a pitchfork. Maybe they had a ghostly pioneer ancestor after all. June clung to Emily. Is it coming to get us, she asked, terrified. Wham, bang, crash. The ghost yelled. You get out of here. The ghost voice, no, daddy's voice, tossed and twisted by the wind, reached the ter terrified girls. Emily felt, re Emily felt weak with relief. Whatever it was, it was going to be all right. Daddy was home from band practice, and if Daddy was home, Mama, wherever she was, was safe. They were all safe. Wham! Bang! Crash! Once more, lightning with a terrible swift sword split the sky and illuminate the whole scene. The ghost was Daddy. Daddy in his white nightshirt. Pitchfork in hand, he was facing Goliath the Bull, who had Mama's copper water wash boiler caught on his horns. Wham! Bang! Crash! Emily understood the sound now. It was Goliath banging the wash boiler against the fence trying to get it off his horns. There was no longer anything frightening about the sound. It's just Goliath, she said. He must have gotten out somehow. Cold as they were, the girls huddled in the doorway, hoping for another bolt of lightning to show them what was going on. They could tell that Daddy was getting the bull back to the barn because the racket gradually moved off toward the barnyard. The girls returned to the kitchen where they stood rubbing their arms to get warm. Soon, Emily climbed onto a kitchen chair to turn on the light. How different the world seemed by the light of one bulb. Ghostly shapes became tear chairs and tables. Plintz dozed with his nose on his paws, just as if he was allowed in the house. To Emily's surprise, the hands on the alarm clock on the shelf pointed to one o'clock. One o'clock in the morning? Never had she been up so late, not even when she got to go with Mama and Daddy to the doings at the Masonic Lodge last winter. Just think, Plint, on June, she said, we have been up all night because it is morning now. I think it still counts as night until about five o'clock, but the light of electricity June had by the light of electricity June had become her old sturdy self again. Besides, we must have gone to sleep. 
I'm sure I didn't sleep a wink, said Emily, who wanted to believe that she had been up all night. I was listening for ghosts. There are no such thing as ghosts. Now June could say this. Things were different than a little while ago. Now Mama came running up on the back porch, but not with her high heels tapping. She was wearing rubbers over her bare feet and an old coat over her nightgown. Her shiny black hair hung over her shoulder in a braid. Mama, where were you? asked Emily. In the door of the woodshed with a pitchfork in case your father needed me, she answered as she stuffed paper and kindling into the stove to start a fire. He finally got Goliath tied up in the barn and is trying to get the wash boiler off of his horns. My good copper washing boiler. She touched a match to the paper and the fire began to crackle cheerfully. So Mama had been standing by ready to attack Goliath with a pitchfork if she was needed. How silly to have thought a mere ghost could run off with Mama. Mama would not have stood for it. She, was, she had too much spunk. Nothing exciting like this ever happens at home, June sounded wistful. All we ever have in the night is a cat fight once in a while. Girls, you must go to bed, insisted Mama. Scoot this very minute. For the second time that night, the two cousins ran upstairs and snuggled into bed. Emily felt warm and cozy now that she knew that Daddy was home. I love to spend the night here, said June drowsily. Mmm. Emily was too sleepy to answer. She had had her scary night after all. A little too scary, maybe, but it was nice to know that in a pinch, June had a runaway imagination too. Emily wriggled closer to her cousin and fell fast asleep. And that is the end of chapter six. And here's a picture of poor Plintz howling and howling and scratching on the door to try to get in. And then here is a picture of the two girls snuggled into bed, very scared because of the noise that they heard outside in the yard. And then here are the two girls shining a flashlight out into the yard trying to figure out what on earth is going on and what that white figure is outside. It turned out that it was their, her uh, Emily's own daddy out there trying to get the big bull back, back into, into its it. pen because it had escaped in the storm. And this is Grandma Carla, and I love you.